look forward to uh, meeting with Richie tonight at 6.30 on Zoom as he continues his study in First Peter. Um, my computer is talking to me. I need to mute it. There we go. <laughs> it said amen. Well, I, I really, really enjoyed that. Thank you both. Um, We have been in the book of Job for several weeks now, and um, Job is a challenging book, challenging to our way of thinking, challenging to, to uh, our, how we live, challenging to our understanding of God. And I believe that Job is in the Word of God for that reason, to challenge us in how we perceive God. The book starts with God allowing Satan to test Job. Testing his integrity and his trust, uh, saying that Job will not curse God. Satan predicted that if you take away his wealth, if you take away his family, if you take away his health, Job would curse God. That the only reason Job followed God was because of the protections and the blessings that God had given. In the dialogue that we saw between his four companions, who were there to comfort and encourage him, we, we see this doctrine of divine retribution that comes out time and time again. Both from the companions and from Job himself. The doctrine of divine retribution simply states that God blesses the righteous and God judges the wicked. And if you look at the plan of God in its entirety, that is true. But when you take only a piece <laughs> if you will, a piece of the cake. It isn't always, always true how God works that out. The, the, the Bible, and specifically in the books of, book of Proverbs and other wisdom literature, says that this is true. And yet we don't always understand how God is working that out. Job has this desire to confront God. He talks about, many times he talks about presenting his case before God and wanting a mediator to stand between him and God. Job believes that he has been treated unjustly by God and yet has not cursed God. Job is willing to admit his sin but cannot find any area that he has not confessed and not admitted already and sacrificed for. Daniel Estes, in his book on the wisdom literature, including the book of Job, says this, in chapter 3 through 31, Job spoke as though he understood precisely how the world should function under God. Don't you love it when somebody comes up to you and, and you're working on something or doing something and, and they come up and they know better than you? And yet you, you understand the problem and you understand, and they come in with an attitude that I, I know it all? We, <laughs> I have to tell you about a man in our church in Michigan. Uh, he's with the Lord now. But we, we would have game nights, and we, we would play this game called Rummy Cube. And uh, this gentleman would, would never play. He would only stand and watch, and he would tell you that he knew how you could win in just three moves. And uh, he would often challenge my wife, who is actually pretty good at that game. And uh, he, he, would, he would stand there and brag to her that he knew how this all should work out, and yet he would never sit down and play the game. Sometimes we have this idea that we know how the world should function under our view of God, but our view of God is that box that we've had. I didn't bring it out today. And what's in that box is so limited, we cannot understand God. Estes goes on to say, what follows in the first speech of God is a lengthy list of questions 
directed to Job. Questions that ask if Job has the wisdom to understand the workings of the cosmos and if he possesses the power to rule over it. I can't tell you how many times I've had people talk to me or I've heard statements that they know how God should do this, how God should work. And I've heard statements like, God would never, or God will always. we got to be careful. We need to be really careful about how much we think we understand. We can't even figure out a virus. A microscopic organism. Everybody on Facebook thinks they figured it out, but you start asking, why are people sick? Why is this happening? Why is the government reacting like they're reacting? Should we be doing this, or should we be doing that, or should we be doing another thing? Job's so-called friend, Elihu, thinks he had it figured out, and he actually comes close, but he misses the mark, and he misses the mark of really helping Job be understanding and submit to God. So God begins to speak. God gives Job what he's asked for. God confronts Job, but it isn't that Job is... Giving an op- being, being given an opportunity to present his grievances. First, God has some questions for the man Job. He started, and we talked last week in the first 11 verses, about the creation himself, itself. Were you there, Job, when I fixed the dimensions of the earth, when I established it? Do you understand what supports the foundations Were you there like the angels were who sang creation story? When I enclosed the oceans and determined its borders, were you there? Do you understand the process of creation, the the time of creation, the process of building, and it's, it's... the wording in this first 11 verses is if he was an architect and a builder and God is asking Job, (laughs) were you there when I swung the hammer, if you will? When I set up the walls of the building? And he has two other questions in this first speech by God. He asks if he understands creation and then he asks if he can if he has the ability to rule over it i want to look at these verses in in some detail he starts in verse 12 have you ever in your life commanded the morning or assigned the dawn its place so that okay here we go about creation there we go uh this, this, this uh, picture that you're seeing on your screen, the one on the left, is the convergence of the, of the Mississippi River and the, the um, Gulf of Mexico. And notice the line of demarcation. God establishes the boundaries. All right, we're, we're moving on. All right, do you understand, d- d- did you ever command the morning? Did you make it, make the sun rise, is what he's asking. He, he talks about the elements of day and night here. The light and darkness, so that it may seize the edges of the earth and shake the wicked out of it. Uh, interesting that he, he com- connects the wicked and darkness in these verses. The earth is changed as clay by its seal, and its hills stand out like the folds of garment. Light is withheld from the wicked, and the arm raised in violence is broken. The morning rises. Have have you ever traveled to the sources of the sea? Have you ever gone to where the water comes from? 
Now, for Job, they didn't understand the oceans nearly as much as we do, and quite frankly, we still don't understand the seas and the oceans very much. There is so much. They're still finding species of sea creatures, fish, and so forth, that they have never seen before. Do you understand its source? Have you walked in the depths of the ocean? This chart on the right-hand side of your screen talks about how deep the ocean is. Miles and miles in its deepest parts. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you comprehended the extent of the earth? Tell me if you know this. The elements of day and night and the sea. The size of the earth. How big it is. And even how small it is. I, I, I remember being at the Creation Museum in Kentucky and going in their planetarium and seeing the relative size of the earth to our galaxy. Our earth is is minuscule. And yet, the Bible takes great detail in talking about the creation of the earth. And as far as space and the stars, it says, oh, he created the stars as well. God asked Job, do you understand the size of the earth? He goes on um, in, in verse 19. Where is the road to ho- the home of light? Do you, do you know where light comes from? They still don't know what light is. Some say it's a wave and so others it's particles. And there's all kinds of different theories about light. And, and really the understanding of light is still not completely understood. And he asked, do you know where it comes from? Uh, the source of light is the stars and the sun. And, and fire is a source of light. Electricity can be a source of light. What is light? Can you lead it back to its borders? Are you familiar with the paths to its home? Do you know, were you already born? Have you lived so long? Light, the speed of light, all of those things. Job, do you understand it? How about snow and hail? Have you entered the place where snow is stored? God here kind of gives, um, it's not anthropomorphizing, but gives an idea of, of uh, storehouses in the sky of snow. Do you, do you understand where snow comes from? Have you seen the storehouses of, of hail? I, I've been in some hailstorms, uh, and, and we know that hail is formed by updrafts today, but Job didn't know those things. He says, have you seen the storehouses of hail, which I hold in reserve for times of trouble, for the day of warfare and battle? God used hail in support of his armies, of the armies of Israel. What road leads to the place where light is dispersed? Where is the source of the east wind that spreads across the earth? Who who cuts the channel uh, for the flooding rain? Or clears the way of lightning. I thought I had a lightning storm on here. Or bring the rain to an uninhabited land on a desert with no human life. Interesting, you know, God God here indicates to Job that he doesn't just bring rain to the places where people are. Job, in your wisdom, are you wise enough that, that you would bring rain? to the uninhabited places of the earth, to satisfy the parched wasteland and cause grass to sprout? Does rain have a father who feathered the drops of dew, fathered the drops of dew? Whose womb did ice come from? When water becomes hard as stone, or I'm sorry, whose womb did ice come from who gave birth to frost of heaven when water becomes hard as stone and the surface of the watery depths is frozen? The elements of 
rain and wind and ice and frost, do you, do you understand these things? They, Job wouldn't have understood water cycles and why water freezes and what happens when, when water freezes. He, he, he was not of that understanding and knowledge in those days. And honestly, with all our scientific expertise, we really don't understand it either. We can't cause ice to form. It happens when we do certain things, but we're not in control of that. He goes on. He goes from the elements here to the, the sky and the stars and space. In verse 31, he says, Can you fasten the chains of Pallades? That's Pallades. Or loosen the belts of Orion? <coughs> Can you bring out the constellation in the season and lead the bear to her cubs? The bear, by the way, is what we call the Big Dipper today. The Big and Little Dipper, the bear and her cub. Do you know the laws of heaven? Can you oppose authority on the earth? Can you command the clouds so that flood waters cover you? He's still looking up at the sky, and he talks about the clouds and the lightning. Can you send lightning boards, bol bolts? And they go. Do they report to you? Here we are. <laughs> I, I almost think God's got some sarcasm here as, as he talks to Job. Can you make a lightning bolt go? Can, do they tell you where they, where they hid and where they're going? Do, do you set its course? Do you bring the clouds so that a flood covers you? We, we haven't even come close to understanding meteorology, let alone controlling it. Job, can you number the clouds? Verse 30, 37. Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? C can you bring rain or can tilt the water jars of heaven when the dust hardens like cast metal and the clods of dirt stick together? I, I don't know if you've seen um, pictures of the Dust Bowl back in the 30s, or I think it was, or the 20s. Um, dates are not my strong suit. Uh, <laughs> but the ground cracks and parched and gets hard as a rock. I, I remember returning to California in 1986 and uh, when my dad took back over the farm out on Shoemake Avenue in, in Modesto. And I remember the weeds in the front part of the orchard were chest high. And dad bought a, an old tractor and a three-point disc and he put me on that tractor. The weeds would slap against my legs. And he wanted that ground tilled up so that it could receive the water and the, the, the weeds would be gone. It took three passes of for what normally would take one. Why? Because of how hard the ground was. There had been no rain. This was in the summer. And there had been very little irrigation. Can you bring the rain? God asked Job. Do you understand meteorology? Do you understand astro uh, astronomy? Do you understand the way the stars move? Can you tell me why the stars rotate like they do? Do you understand the creation, Job? Do you really understand it science seeks to understand god's creation and science has barely scratched the surface today what we don't understand still far outweighs what we do whether it be medical science or whether it be meteorology how how many of you trust the weather forecast to be accurate more than one day out, and even then. Yeah, that's science. 
they can't predict it very well. From that, he turns to, do you have the knowledge and understanding to rule over the creation? Can you rule over the creation? Can you not pray for a lioness or satisfy the appetite of young lions? Can you provide food for the ravens? Verse 41, who provides the ravens food? when its young cry out to God and wonder about her lack of food. He asks if he understands or knows or can rule over the the birth cycle of mountain goats and and deer, which may be a reference to the... um, Oh, I just lost it. Gazelle, uh, the deer and the gazelle are often connected in the uh, Old Testament. Do you know when mountain goats give birth? Have you watched the deer in labor? Can you count the months they are pregnant so that you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and give birth to their young. They deliver their newborn. Their offspring is healthy and grow up in the open field. They leave and do not return. Do you understand these things, Job? Can you rule over them? Who set the wild donkey free? Who released the swift donkey? Whoops, wrong button. There we go. Mountain goats, the donkeys. Then God says, I made. Job, I did this. I made him a home in the wilderness. He is free. He scoffs at the noise of the village, never hear the shouts of a driver. He roams the mountains for pasture land. Would the wild ox be willing to serve you? Would you be able to tame the wild ox? God says no. It's beyond your ability I set them free. I put them where they're at. Would it, verse 11, would you leave it to do your hard work? Can you trust the wild ox to harvest your grain and bring it to the threshing threshing floor? Then God talks about something else. Interestingly, God goes from these animals that, that seem to have some sense about them to an animal he created With no sense. What about the ostrich? The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but her feathers and plumage, but her feathers and plumage are like the storks. She abandons her eggs on the ground and let them be warmed in the sand. She forgets that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not her own, with no fear that her labor may have been in vain. For God has deprived her of wisdom. Would, would you, in your world, would you have created such a dumb animal, Job? When, if you rule over the, the world, if you have the capability of understanding how things should be, does the ostrich fit into your plans? She proudly spreads her wings. She laughs at the horse and its rider. The, the uh, ostrich can outrun the horse. Laughs as he, she takes off so fast. Well, what about the horse, he asks. Did you give it its strength? Did you put the mane on its neck, verse 19 of chapter 39? That's where we're at. Did you make him leap like a locust? He's proud, his proud snorting fears one with terror. The war horse and the strength that he has, did you do that, Job? He laughs at fear since he is afraid of nothing. He does not run from the sword. A quiver rattles at his side along with a flashing spear and a lance, and yet he charges ahead with trembling rage. He cannot stand still at the trumpet or sound. Were you in charge of the horse? Finally, as he talks about these animals of of nature and he he's going to talk about two more which we'll get to next week he goes to the eagle 
and the hawk. Do they fly by your understanding, he said. By, by your understanding of the world, are you the one that designed the hawk and the eagle and can make them soar and make their nest high on a cliff? Are you the one that caused their eyes to see far? Verse 29, their eyes penetrate its distance. Chapter 40, verse 1. God speaks directly to Job again. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct them? Let him who argues with God give an answer. Dr. Estes again comments on this verse and says this, speaking directly to Job in words that echo chapter 38, verse 1 through 3. Yahweh says in verse 2 of chapter 40, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. God, Yahweh, refuses to put be put on the defensive by Job's assertion of innocence in chapter 29 through 31. Instead, he puts the burden of proof on Job to demonstrate that he is qualified to reprove God by answering the questions or arguments that God has posed to him. Job then has two alternatives. Either he will have to acknowledge that he cannot answer the questions and therefore concede that he must trust the superior wisdom of God, Yahweh, or he will answer the questions and therefore manifest that he has sufficient understanding to call Yahweh into account. My, my eagle and my, my hawk, I forgot to put those up there. Warren Wiersbe says this, until we are silenced before God, he cannot do for us what needs to be done. As long as we defend ourselves and argue with God, he cannot work for us and in us and in us to accomplish his plan through us. Job was not quite broken and at the place of sincere repentance yet. He became silent, but not yet submissive. So God continued his address. This is what God says, or what Job says as he responds to God. Then Job answered the Lord, verse 3, chapter 40. I am so insignificant. I don't know how you can read those verses and, and, and think about these creatures that God has talked about and not find yourself as insignificant. How can I answer you? I, I place my hand over my mouth indicating that he will be silent rather than to answer as a fool, whether to, than to answer as one who has seen his insignificance. But I want you to notice this, what he says in verse 5. I have spoken once, and I will not reply twice, but now I can add nothing. Job does not retract what he has already said about his innocence. Job does not retract his desire to, for God to hear him, his desire for God to see his case and to fix the problem. He does not retract any of that. He said, I have spoken. But I'm not going to say it again. I'm not foolish enough to open my mouth the second time. God has begun to show Job that he's sovereign in the universe. That God in his wisdom understands his creation and how things should work. And that Job saying, hey, but you messed up in my life is really a fool speaking. Wearsby said this as well. Knowledge of our own ignorance is the first step towards true wisdom. Let me say that again. Knowledge of our own ignorance is the first step in true wisdom. God will again speak to Job about two creatures in chapters 40 and 41. Creatures 
that were so incredibly magnificent of creation, strong and mighty and untamable. Behemoth and Leviathan. These creatures God uses to show that God is in control of them, but man could never be. And then as we come to chapter 42, which we'll cover next week, we see Job finally ready to be submissive to God, to submit to his authority and to his plan, and to stop arguing about why God would do things. You see, Job's asking why was never the problem. Job demanding God answer him on a charge of doing something wrong, that was a problem. You you see, we are not sovereign over the universe. We've been placed here to be managers under God of his creation, but we are not sovereign over it. God is. And we must be careful to acknowledge in all things, Proverbs chapter 3, in all your ways acknowledge him, that God is doing these things for his own purpose, and even if we don't understand them, we need to praise and glorify him for them. Job's friends didn't help him do that. They led him down a path that told him that he was somehow responsible for the calamities that came on him. When in fact God was using these things for his own purpose, I want to remind you just as we close that Jesus and the disciples walked up on a blind man and the blind man, the, the, the disciples asked about the blind man, is he blind because he sinned or because of his parents' sin? There was an assumption that he was under judgment because of his blindness. Just as Job's friends assumed that judge, Job was under judgment because of his calamity. Jesus answered is very instructive for us. Neither this man nor his parents, but that God may be glorified. We must remember that the things that we go through, the difficult times as well as the good, are all so that we can fulfill the purpose that God put man here for, and that's to glorify him. We are here for one reason, to glorify God. Whether that be in health, or illness, in wealth, or poverty, we're to glorify God. Whether that be in social distancing and wearing masks because of a pandemic, or whether that be in fellowship and worshiping together, we're to glorify God. So let me ask you this as we close. What are you doing today to give Him the glory? What are you doing this week to show that you give God all the glory and all the praise. Father, we do want to give that to you. We want to praise your name. We want to glorify you. This week, help us. Help us to praise your name. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Father, we need to be giving back the praise and the glory because of that salvation. Because you are sovereign. Because you loved us. We did not first love you. You first loved us. So help us, Father, to respond well. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to 